Hello everyone. It is time for another live stream and I have a topic that I thought was a good one for us to consider or to discuss. And I was kind of hoping for some information from you as well on what you're doing and how you're doing it so that others like myself can copy you. <laughs> because this hobby is full of people trying to help one another. So first of all, I want to catch you guys up on you know, a few details. Um, and I also want to make sure we have sound. So somebody, thank you very much, Robert. That was perfect timing. <laughs> um, okay, so my neck has been a nightmare. And I told you guys last weekend I wasn't feeling well. I just thought maybe I was catching a cold. But no, it was the discs in my neck that are, well, I've decided, I've come up with a term after 10 years of suffering this. I call it angry neck. And my neck has been very angry all week. I finally got in to see my doctor who then gave me a prescription to go get an MRI. So I'm going to get a couple of those, or <laughs> I kind of want two. I kind of want one of the neck and then the top of the area of my shoulder blades. Because the pain I've been through is almost unbearable is the best description I can give you. I mean, I'm right at the cusp of I can't take it anymore. It's not just me whining or saying, oh, I'm sore. It's nothing like that. It is an unbelievable amount of pain. And my own doctor said, I want you to start taking hydrocodone daily for 14 days. And, uh, you know, I already had a prescription. I've had it for a long, long time, and I rarely take it. And so for the last <clears throat> three days, I've been taking it twice a day. And uh, I haven't taken it yet today because of the live stream, but my neck is hurting right now. So <clears throat> I will do the MRI. And then I will meet with various people I know and get their opinions before we do anything. But I have this feeling something is mechanically wrong inside my neck that has to be addressed. It's not going to be something like traction or acupuncture or chiropractic help is going to solve. I think there's something really wrong. But uh, what do I know? I'm not a doctor. Okay. The other thing I want to mention really quick is that uh, today is the 10th of August, which means that my tank is now five years, nine months old. Today's another one of those 30-day anniversaries. I always like to celebrate on the 10th by getting a nice picture of my reef. And so I will be taking that today and posting it. The uh, tank is running just fine. The no pox situation is no better. <laughs> it's still slimy. Uh, I've I spent some time earlier this week, you know, I can only get a little bit done because of my neck. And uh, so like one day I was able to mow the grass. And I thought, well, one of the reasons I wanted to do the grass was I was going to be out in the heat. And sometimes when you're sore in your back, uh, the heat can help. So I thought I'd do that. Plus my lawnmower is self-propelled, so it kind of pulls itself. It's not like I was really working it. And it did seem to loosen things up. Um, another day I cleaned out the, as much of the slime as I could out of the refugium. And uh, I don't know. Oh, and then one day I washed my truck finally for the first time in two months. <laughs> so... I mean, I feel like I'm getting so little done because I'm hurting so badly, but I am still getting orders out. And actually, I'm really pleased. Right now, my workload has been really low. I'm very fortunate in that regard because I've been so in so much pain that I can't really do anything. I mean, right now, I feel really, really hot, and I haven't even taken any medication today. So obviously, my body is just stressed out beyond what it can handle. Um, okay, so... That was the other thing. And then finally, uh, Machina is coming up at the end of this month. And, you know, unless something horrific happens, I will be there. Uh, I already booked my trip, you know, a year ago. <laughs> so I should be there, and hopefully I will be feeling a little bit better. Maybe after 14 days of hydrocodone, I'll be doing just great. Who knows? But, uh, you know, I the good thing is I'm not an addict. I've never had that addictive personality. You know, I, I like to be a perfectionist. I, I can be a little bit OCD about stuff, but I'm not an addict. So I can take these pills and not worry about becoming horribly addicted to them because I've been around them for a long time and I, I'm pretty judicious. So right now I'm just being cautious. And uh, I actually noticed on the bottle, it said I could take it about three times a day on that bottle. So um, I don't know, I've, I've taken two a day. All right, today's topic is about mounting hardware. And this is such an important topic that I felt like I needed to share it with you. Now I know we're sitting at a desk, but I actually have pictures to show you and maybe a video clip if it'll play on this stream, I don't know. Um, so this is a visual presentation. It's not necessarily a good one for a podcast or for those of you listening while you're driving, but uh, I wanted to show you some things to help you understand how you can secure equipment under your aquarium 
in a way where it does not fall off the stand and fall into your, uh, you know, your sump or, or, or cause liquid to flow somewhere. Uh, for example, a friend of mine used command strips, which is a type of a double stick tape that is essentially removable eventually, I guess. I've never used it. Uh, to secure her dosing pumps inside the stand and one of them let go one day and the dosing pump fell down. Well, you think, okay, so the pump fell. But when it fell, it fell below the level of the liquid of her alkalinity dose. And so through gravity and siphon, it has trickled all of her solution into the sump and she ended up losing, I don't know, 80, 90% of her livestock because of an alkalinity overdose because the dosing pump fell. So I want you guys to secure things in a way where you know 100% it's gonna stay there. So the first thing you would want to do, you know, switch cameras here, you're going to want a screw. And when you're shopping for a screw, you want to find one, let's know, hopefully this will be focused, you want to find one that will not go too deeply into the wood, but goes in far enough that it holds on. So this one right here, I believe is a half an inch, no, maybe three quarters of an inch total. It's a wood screw. <laughs> Sorry, I'm holding the wrong spot. It's a wood screw. It's got the tapered neck, and I'm gonna show you why this is beneficial for the one thing I did. So let me switch over to my presentation here. So here are the things that, oh, let me switch this. I don't like this camera sitting here. How do I switch this? Hang on, give me one second to think. Let me try this. Yes, there we go. Okay, so these sticky pads are really inexpensive. You can buy a bag of 50 or 100 at Home Depot, and you can basically secure them anywhere you want inside your stand, underneath, on the wall, whatever. You, and usually they come with Vortec pumps to connect the cable and keep your Vortec pump from hitting the floor, which is important because they're not cheap. But I was looking at the inside of the circle and it's tapered down there. It's got that recessed spot, which is perfect for this screw to go in. So let me switch pictures here. Uh, sorry, I gotta move things out of my way as usual. All right. So now there is a sticky pad that I've affixed on the underside of my aquarium. And then I put a screw through it to hold that sticky pad in place. The reason this is so important is because you don't want to rely on the glue of the sticky pad to do all the work. It's great for getting in a place and holding it there while you're dealing with a drill. I mean, think about that. How convenient is that? You know, like, and then you can go ahead and put your screw through it and keep it there forever. The, the use of just using the sticky pad is fine for a situation where you're not worried about something fall, you know, being pulled off. These don't hold forever. Even if you were to replace this sticky stuff, with a better quality tape, like the 3M one that I really love, it still could at some point let go. So putting a screw through it is your best bet. And uh, all I did was use a drill, of course. And then when you've got it in there, you can see like the picture on your screen, it's completely recessed, so it doesn't block anything. And then you've got these little slots that you can run some zip ties through it to secure a cable or whatever you want to do. But I want you to give, it the, give some thought to this because I felt it was something you could do. All right, uh, next picture shows my power cable. Now this right here that you're looking at is the power supply that is feeding my cooling fans on my sump. And the power, the plugs are so large and the distance was so far from the apex, I had to run a six foot extension cord, I think, six or eight feet. So I went ahead and I secured it. And then I cut off the excess of the zip tie with, a, uh, with some uh, wire cutters. And I want to show you also, I verified that the screw was not going to go in deeper than the thickness of the wood under my aquarium. Because the last thing you want to do is accidentally drill a hole <laughs> or drill a screw into the glass bottom of, or acrylic bottom of your aquarium. So by having that, you know, verifying the screw cannot go too deep, it gives you one more assurance you're not going to make an error and have uh, the tip of the screw stick out through the front door of your cabinet, stick out the side, or poke through and hit the tank, like I said, or the sump, or whatever it is you're doing. So I hope that this kind of helps you uh, with that regard, you know, to understand it. So here's my power plug, and here are the fans in place. And then here I actually used another sticky near the 
three-prong plug or the three-outlet plug of the power cord. That was pretty heavy. I think I used two in that spot. Or yeah, I used one on this end and then one on the far end you can't see in the picture to support it fully so it could not fall into uh, any water. It's up safe and sound. Also, you'll notice there's that metal bracket in the foreground of that picture right there. And that metal bracket is how I adjust the hanging of my refugium light by moving that S hook from one hole to the next hole. So I can have the light hang at the normal height, which is that hole right there it's in. But if I need to lift it up to get access to the, the macroalgae, I can go ahead and pull out the S hook and move it to like two or three holes over and really lift the light up out of my way and really light the area I'm working in the sump. It's kind of convenient in that way too. So it's an adjustable light. All right, so that was the first thing I wanted to show you guys. And how do I get out of this? <laughs> all right. Um, this tape right here, I found at Home Depot. It says 3M on it. That's all I know. It's made for wet applications. And so it's really important that you clean the area first. I like to use rubbing alcohol first and then apply the tape to it. I'll tell you this, this stuff is, you know, it holds on really great, you know, but it's really hard to get off the red part to reveal the other side of the sticky. And I'll use a razor blade and I'll be fighting it for like 30, 45 seconds till I finally get enough to peel it off. It really is super sticky. Uh, I love this stuff. And if you're securing a dosing pump to the edge of your sump, for example, this probably would hold it there in place. On my last sump, I had a cooling fan bracket and I used two strips of that red tape to hold the bracket to the top of my sump. Never budged. Matter of fact, when I sold that sump, I sold in the bracket with it. I didn't pull it off. I said, you might as well put a fan in there yourself and use it too. So really great tape, probably cost 10 or $11, I guess, at Home Depot. And it, a little bit goes a very long way. And it, it is very practical. There's gonna be times where you're gonna say, oh my God, I'm so glad I bought that. So I would definitely recommend that one. If you secure anything inside your cabinet with like screws, like let's say it was the, uh, some Apex gear or the dose, uh, dosing pump head or something like that, you wanna make sure that the screws are embedded far enough in and are secure that when you hang the item on there, it can't get knocked off. That's really important. And if you ever have doubts about what you've secured, you can also reinforce with maybe a couple of eye hooks, eyelets, I think they're called, where you screw that in, it has a little circle, and you can put a bungee cord across the front. That's another safety that might come into play. For example, if you had a calcium reactor and you had a CO2 tank that you had to support under the tank, you didn't want to, to come plummeting down or fall off the shelf, putting a, 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 a bungee cord around that would be smart. Oh, someone just mentioned Velcro. Velcro can work for super light things. You can buy really high durable or high duty, heavy duty uh, Velcro that can help hold things in place. But a lot of people over time realize that they things just let go. Uh, the glue on the backside can just let go at some point. So you're gonna have to kind of keep an eye on it. Another trick that works, if you own a staple gun, is you can go ahead and you can put the Velcro on the cabinet and then you can staple it into the wood so the Velcro has nowhere to go. So again, you got to practice by putting it in place with sticky and try it out. And then if you're happy, then staple a couple of staples into the wood so that Velcro is absolutely solid in there. And then the back side of the thing you're trying to hang like some kind of a, a driver for a return pump or a, a driver for a, an in-tank flow pump, you clean the back with some rubbing alcohol and then you put on the Velcro on that one and you should be able to put it in place and it should be reliable. So these are some things that I, I like to recommend. And uh, I just thought you guys would want to copy this one. <laughs> I thought that was a really important one. You can also buy tons of these little zip ties. Uh, at Home Depot, they sell them in a pack of, I think, 50. Uh, Harbor Freight probably sells them in a pack of 2,000. And these that I'm using right here are 100% plastic. Some zip ties inside this section here will have a little piece of metal. If you have the kind of zip tie with metal in it, you should not use it underwater because the metal will rust. But if it's an all plastic zip tie, then you are safely able to use that in your aquarium underwater. Like if you were to put it around the nozzle of a power head for some tubing and you want to secure it so it doesn't pop off, this would work. All right, so that's kind of that. Let me show you while I'm at it. I'm gonna find this stuff real quick. Give me a second here. Um, the refugium light, because I want to talk about one more thing about something I do that probably most people don't. Oh, 
Alrighty, um, let's switch screens again. And this time I'm gonna try to play the video. I don't know if it's gonna play for you guys or not. So we'll see what happens here. Uh, okay. Hey, it's moving. All right, cool. So that was my old Refugium White that I installed uh, nine years ago, and it hung on stainless steel cables with that S-hook system I showed you where I could elevate it and lower it. This light is really heavy. I think it weighs something like 10 or 12 pounds by itself, which doesn't seem like much, but it's quite a bit for a light. And then I replaced it with uh, this one, which is the XHO. Uh, let me do... No, we'll do this one. <laughs> so this one here, you can see it's kind of moving because I just, I barely got it hung and I grabbed the camera instantly and filmed it. <laughs> so it's rocking back and forth a little bit. Now, what I did with this light is I hung it with fishing line. And that has been my go-to for the last few years. I've just found fishing line is so much easier than anything else. And it, I can just tie a knot. I can cut it with scissors. I can use a new piece. I can replace a piece. It's no big deal. So... What I'm suggesting to you is that you go find yourself some of this at Walmart. So this one here is the 50 pound test. So it's a pretty thick fishing line compared to, I guess, what most fishermen use. I don't know, I'm not a fisherman. I'm a coral guy, but I love this stuff and it's super dur durable. And when you're hanging a light that's like five pounds and let's say that light has four screws, like four different hanging points, that's uh, like 1.25 pounds per corner off of a 50 pound test th uh, fishing line. So I would just secure this onto the light, tie a really super duper knot, and then I'd run it up. And I did take some pictures. Now we gotta switch to my phone. I apologize, guys. Let me um, see if I can do this with a lot of notifications. Let's see if, oh cool, my uh, computer's ready for this. All right, so let me find some pictures here. So here is a picture. And you can see my finger pointing at where the fishing line is and you can see the line going straight up vertically. And here is the bar with the S hook and you can see the fishing line holding on. And here I can kind of, whoops, zoom in a little bit. So you can see that's fishing line with like a super knot. And what I did was I ran my fishing line through one of my sticky pads. And that way, it's a slider. So better than a roller or uh, some kind of a guide, I just used a sticky pad. I also used a sticky pad on the other end, right here, to keep the fishing line over this pipe. Oh, I'm sorry. I moved it a little bit too... I moved off frame. Okay, so that right there is a cross beam that my, wa my uh, walk board goes into. And I put the fishing line over that because it's super strong. It's steel. <laughs> but then it was moving around a little bit, so I took a sticky pad and I secured it on there. So that way the line has to stay in that spot and can't move to the front, can't move to the back, and it keeps the light hanging perfectly over my refugium zone now. And that was all the pictures. And so, uh, did I have one more? Yeah, so I've got this one here. Switch back one more time, guys. And we'll go here. And so now you can see it hanging in place at its official height. And this is the XHO uh, LED lighting that I got from ReefBright. This light is 6,500 Kelvin, 5,100 Kelvin, I think. I'm guessing it's two different spectrums of white light. And it works out really, really well for what I've been doing. I've been watching the plants, and the plants have not declined since switching from the old light to the new one, which is good. Because the new light seemed less bright to my eye, and I, thought, I was a little bit concerned. So I hope that was somewhat interesting for you guys, and I would love to answer some of your questions now. Uh, or even, you know, to read some of your feedback. I appreciate all the things that uh, you guys share with me as well. It's not always all about me. <laughs> I do care about what you're thinking. So, uh, Eric, if you're doing, or, or uh, Andrea, if you're doing the live chat questions, feel free to use the doc. I've got it open in front of me. I'm going to scroll up and uh, see what all you guys said. And that is kind of where we're at for today. And I know that that wasn't a very long stream so far, but we are where we are. Uh, also, uh, Club Milo's Reef celebrated its first... Oh, how do I do this? Hang on, give me one second to find this thing. I'm going to close this. Move this. Uh, where is it? I hid it for myself, obviously. All right, that's too big. 
shrink this down a little bit and then maybe I can share it with you guys. Let's see what this looks like. Yeah, here we go. So Club Milo's Reef is celebrating its first one year anniversary as of the 8th of this month. We've been in existence for a solid year on Facebook and we are a non-judgment group. In other words, we just help each other and we're not mean. And that was the whole point of the group. And so far, so good. We have like 5,340 people in there right th now. And um, I, I just love that we have a good group of people. And I don't need to be huge with thousands and thousands of people if they're all good people. You know, I mean, that's the downside. When You know how you always hear, oh, there's a few bad apples? So I'm really glad that we just have good apples. <laughs> let's just keep staying there. Let, let's not mess it up. All right. Back off of that. So I wanted to let you guys know about that. If you have not gone to Club Milo's Reef yet, which I know some of you have not, it's facebook.com slash groups slash Milo's Reef. And uh, it's funny because, you know, when you apply to join the group, there's three questions. And one of the questions says, how did you hear about this group? And a lot of times people will say the live stream. I've been watching your live stream for a whole year. Well, I've been mentioning this group for a whole year and you're finally now joining. I'm still glad you did it. I don't know why it took you this long, but I'm super glad that you have joined. So feel free to, uh, to join now and uh, enjoy. I mean, we share some really good pictures. We have good discussions. We answer questions about critter ID or, or, or uh, what is this in my tank? That happens a lot. Um, sometimes people ask questions about coding for the Apex. Um, or people are discussing new products coming to market like Mindstream. I mean, there's a lot of conversations that come up. And so we, uh, we talk about it all. And I feel, at least I hope, that people don't worry how will people respond if I ask this question. Because the whole point was so you could ask a question and get an answer. Just like you ask here on the live stream and I try to answer you immediately. It's the same thing, but that group is going 24 hours a day where I'm only on here one hour each week. Alrighty. Uh, Joey, I just saw your comment just now. Thank you so much for telling me that. Uh, where were you all week? <laughs> I really, I, I mean, there wasn't a lot I could do. I was able to get a few orders out, uh, which was good. Um, I decided to only do what I absolutely had to do. I got a couple things built uh, Thursday night so those things could cure, and then they will go out on Monday. That Because it's so hot right now, I don't want to ship anything I've made out of acrylic that hasn't cured for a few days, because I'm afraid that the baking of the box will actually weaken the seam or actually add a lot of bubbles into the seam. So I've been kind of slowing down on what goes out. But as of last night, there's only three people waiting for an order next week. Yeah, I'm so happy about that. Um, I also am going to mention that uh, I'm going to mention, I'm going to call out a person on here. His name is Robert Suttle, and he has been the most patient guy with me ever. I've, uh, he asked me to help him design his sump that he has to have built. He's in Europe, and he's been asking me, Mark, you know, when can you have time? Do you have time? Do you have time? And I have just been hurting. And uh, it's just, it's really hard for me to even sit at my desk. It's, it's hard for me to do anything. I mean, I'm sitting in a chair, I'm watching television, I stand, I walk, I went to the gym a couple of times trying to work out different muscle groups, anything to get some relief. And, uh, it's just really hard for me to focus. And I'm, I'm actually not involved in long conversations. This will be the longest conversation I've had this week with you guys on the live stream. Uh, it, it just hurts to think, so, yeah. All right, um, let's see. Okay, Alfredo says a good point. Um, you have a, pr he says, it's a big problem for him because the stand is made of glass. If it is made of glass, I still think you could use the sticky pads and you could use the red tape on the back to really stick it to the glass. Clean the glass super well, apply super clean sticky tape that didn't have fingerprints on it with oils from your flesh and stick it on there, it'll probably stay. Another thing you can do, which may not be very pleasing because it is glass, is to support a board on the, you know, like cut out a board that's gonna fit inside your stand on one side that's the right height and the right width. And you could probably even sticky that board to the glass and now you have spots to screw into. And that way you could secure the things you want to secure. See, I'm a problem solver. Let's see. Uh, the Lone Aquarius says that this is a good topic for earthquake country like California. Absolutely, and matter of fact, uh, I guess I should take this one step further. 
I'm, I used to live in California. I lived through a lot of earthquakes. I didn't have an aquarium back then, but I would say that at the very least, based on what I've seen, I would recommend that you secure your stand to the wall with some kind of like a safety cable. Like if you had an eyelet, again, screwed into a stud, and then you brought a cable out, you know, like a stainless steel wire, and you looped it through something on the back side of the stand, and then you crimped it so it stays, that would keep the stand from moving away from the wall. So in theory, your tank would rock, but it wouldn't rock as much as a free-floating stand. If the stand is tethered, I'm hoping the tank stays. Now, if it's a really bad earthquake, it might just throw it off the stand anyway. But if you're in California, you've already come to terms with the fact that you might lose things you own. But I would try to secure the stand as best you can. Um, I don't think you could secure the tank. I think it'll just rip itself to shreds. Uh, you might be able, if you had a tank with a canopy, you might be able to secure the top so it, it's less likely to topple because it's being kind of tethered and the wood is holding it so you know it's trying to fall this way and it's like can't go because it's connected to a wall. Uh, I hope those hand gestures made sense to you, <laughs> but it is something you want to consider. Hey Shane, thanks for noticing my shirt. I got this shirt because I'm always late and I loved it. I saw it at Comic-Con. I was like, this is so my shirt. And the irony is not lost on me that today I was I did my live stream on time. It's the one time I did it on time. I'm gonna start wearing this shirt every single time I'm late, just because, you know, but uh, yeah, it's a funny shirt. All right, um, turn this off. Uh, someone made the comment that your his CO2 scrubber was knocked off by his granddaughter. Okay, so my grandchild was in my living room a few weeks ago, and within seconds, I mean, it was so fast, and my I was watching my grandson with my son. We were both watching him, and I saw him head to the refugium, and my son was like, no, 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 and within that heartbeat, he threw some batteries in my refugium that I had a hard time finding in all the macroalgae. So uh, you want to secure your aquarium from children. Now, if you are having grandchildren over, you could put up one of those temporary fences to kind of protect around so they have to walk around and can't get near the tank. You could secure the cabinetry with locks or magnets or something to actually hold it tight. Uh, you can put that grandchild in a crib where it cannot crawl around loose. I mean, you know, those, those kind of things. But yeah, there is the risk of humans messing with your tank. So when you're securing things, you want to also consider what would happen if someone else reached under here? Would they bump it? And you know, who would be reaching under there? Well, what if you had to have a spouse help you or a child? Or what if you had a tank sitter? Or uh, you had the fish store employee come over to watch your tank while you're traveling? Any of those people could bump something that you totally know to avoid. So you wanna make sure that your stuff is bolted down really good so that way they don't cause any damage. <laughs> Joey says, zip ties are the duct tape of reefing. They really are. Zip ties are awesome. All right. Hello, Jacques. He says he's here from South Africa. Thanks for tuning in on the live stream. Uh, James says, is your refugium light available in 24 or 36 inch fixture? The one I have on there is a 36, but I had them custom make it 40 inches long because I wanted it to be the width of the exact spot that was hanging in my in my opening of my sump. Let me see if I can pull that up again. What did I do with it? So let me go back a picture. I think this is a good one. I just won't hit play on this, but if you look at it, it's, oh, I'm kind of in the way here. Let me see if I can move myself up here. Okay, so you can see I've got it start, I don't know if you can see my mouse or not, but uh, can you see a mouse? I bet you can't. On the left side, you can see it's within the, the rounded corner and on the right, it stops before the teeth because I didn't want to light the rest of the sump. I wanted to light the plants itself. And this has worked out really well. And I'm not seeing a lot of nuisance algae. I know I haven't put up any kind of a shade yet like I normally do. I've been kind of just <laughs> doing the least I can possibly do. And it's still not becoming a big problem in the sump. I'm not seeing all kinds of hideous stuff. So I found that this works out really well. And I like that I have it hanging this low. If I were to raise it up about two inches higher, I would get more light spread front to back. But I'm looking at the plants, you know, right now I'm looking at the refugium and it's lit. And it looks 
well lit. It doesn't look like I need to raise it up. And if I were to raise it up, then I would see the reflection of the lights off that top rim that's right there in the front that, that does like a mirror bounce and it kind of blinds you. So I'm, I'm actually happy I could recess it down. But I also want you to notice that the light is still high enough up, I mean just barely, that if the sump were to fill up to the brim, that light won't get wet. And maybe I could raise it another quarter of an inch just for safety's sake. Now, if you hang lights like I did with the uh, fishing line, what you could do, because fishing line is so cheap, and when you buy a roll, you probably get, I don't know, a thousand feet of this stuff. <laughs> it says 150 yards, uh, 450 feet. Um, you could use an extra piece that is like your maximum it can come down, like a safety tether. And this, so now you've got your adjustable, and then you've got your, oops, I dropped it, and the safety just takes over and keeps it from falling all the way in. Now, if you don't want to do the fishing line, if you want to go with something that's more permanent, you can definitely use the stainless steel cable, the aluminum crimps, uh, roller pulleys, and uh, S-hooks. I did all that, and after nine years, I removed a lot of rusty stuff. I mean, it, it just, over time, just, it rotted away. It did not hold up. So I was like, eh, I have this fishing line. That light is so light, I'm just going to go with this. And while I'm talking about the refugium briefly, I do want to also mention that I run my lights nine hours a day because people always say, how long do you run your lights? And they also say, what macroalgae is this? So this is feather calerpa. And the reason I grow feather calerpa is because it grows for me. I've tried other things, and this is the one that wins. And I'm like, you know what? So be it. It's sort of like my lawn. I have St. Augustine mostly, but there's some weird stuff growing out there. And I'm just not worrying about the other stuff. It's green too, so I'm going to call it good. But would I like it to be wall-to-wall -wall St. Augustine and look like a golf course? Yeah, it'd be kind of cool, but I'm not willing to spend the money to make it do that. So it just, I water it, I fertilize it, I pull the weeds, and I mow it. And, you know, it, that is what it is. And in my refugium, feather calerpa has been the biggest win for me for the last two decades. Where I've tried ketomorpha, doesn't seem to work so well for me. I don't know why. Uh, so this is the one I recommend. <clears throat> okay. Alrighty. Um, let's ask, let's answer a question. So Anna Marie asks if she can use fluconazole to defeat hair algae. You definitely can, and the product does work, and you're going to want to follow the instructions very carefully. I think I just watched a video on Marine Depot's website that went into all the details of how to use it, and the product is called Reef Flux, and I do sell it on my website. So if you need that, I've got it in stock, and I can ship it out. The, uh, the product needs your skimmer off for at least two weeks, probably three. And that way the medicine can just work on your tank and help uh, to kill off the algae that's bothering you. Now, bryopsis is way more stubborn than hair algae. And it might take a bigger dose or a longer period to make that, er, to eradicate it. And then bubble algae is even worse. It's even stronger. So I've heard rumor and I've had a couple of people confirm that if you use fluconazole at triple the strength, it will kill the bubble algae in your tank. So if you are in that situation, if one of you listeners are into that situation right now and wishing you didn't have it, that is an option that can help remove bubble algae from your tank. But I personally have not had to use fluconazole yet because I just never have hair algae in any of my tanks. I, just, I haven't had it in forever. So I haven't had a chance to do it myself. Paul says, I've recently lost all my hammer and torch corals and I'm wondering if running carbon would help. I have some good sized toadstools and other leathers. Yeah, I would bet that your leathers are affecting your LPS corals. And so I would definitely recommend running carbon. And last week's video was about carbon and then I have a, a, an actual video, uh, an edited video about running carbon. And basically I'm recommending you put in a reactor. I'm recommending half a cup per 50 gallons of water volume and rinse it really well. And uh, the flow going through the carbon should be very slow and it will only last you a few days. So that's me summarizing an hour into, what was that, 40 seconds? So, but you can watch the whole thing if you want to learn more. Uh, Tyler asks, what product are you using for dosing magnesium? I haven't dosed magnesium in over three months, maybe even four, because the Trident keeps saying my magnesium is almost 1500. I don't know that I believe that number, but uh, I'm gonna send off an ICP test, hopefully on Monday. 
I'm gonna measure everything. I'm gonna grab a screenshot of my automated testing and I'm gonna send off the samples and then I'm gonna see what they come back and I'm gonna compare everything side by side and see if I can come out to what I consider the truth of the number. But the product I actually use is called Magnesium Pronto. I sell it on my website. One small jar will make five gallons of magnesium solution. It's like 20 bucks, $21. And I've been using that one for magnesium for the last few years. But I stopped dosing it when the Trident said my magnesium was so high because I only wanted around 1400 ppm and it was a little too high. So we'll see. But uh, when I go back to it, I will be dosing it again. I have a couple of different dosing pumps that I use. And normally what I do is I make up a gallon, I stick it under the tank and I hook it up to a dosing pump and I let the dosing pump add 90 milliliters a day until the jug is empty. So if that takes a week, 10 days, whatever it is, once it's empty, I'm done. I don't do it again for like a month because usually you have to add a lot of magnesium and it finally brings the number up and then the number stays up for a good long time. So I'm not one of those guys that doses magnesium every single day for the rest of my life. I just do it once a month. And like I said before, I, I haven't done it in three or four months and my tank is still alive, so that's a miracle. Harkins asked me, how's your hand? Well, the thumb is completely healed. The finger I burned is, you can still see a little bit of a scar there. I don't know if that's gonna fade away completely or not. I cooked the hell out of that finger. And uh, while you, there's no like damage, it's completely numb. <laughs> I keep bumping it and it's not, it feels bad. But works great, I'm very lucky uh, and they completely uh, took care of me. So I appreciated that that was done. Let's see. Rosano says, my hippo tang has lateral line disease. Anything I can do to help him? You would want to see if your tank has stray electricity. You would want to improve your tang's diet with better foods possibly. And you would want to make sure that you are not putting in so much carbon and carbon dust in your tank to be giving your fish the HLLE that it's suffering from. Uh, one of the things you could do is pull the tang out and put it in a separate system. And that might require medication. That's stuff I don't know about because I'm not a fish disease guy. But you, if the tang does better in a different tank, then you need to go to the first tank and find out what is wrong in there that affected the fish and can you correct it. So when you put the fish back, it's safe and healthy. Hey, Nick, thanks very much for the compliment. I appreciate that. Hey, Kevin, guess what? I uh, got your Apex gear in. I just haven't called you and let you know because I've been hurting. <laughs> so it's here if you want to pick it up this weekend. Actually, oh, yeah. So last week, no, the game part of this week, I got in all the Neptune Systems gear that I ordered. I ordered a whole bunch of gear because I'm starting selling it for my shop. I've had the option to sell it for over a year and I finally pulled the trigger and did it. And I ordered uh, some Apexes, uh, an Apex EL or LE, I always say it wrong. I think it's EL. Um, auto feeders, uh, breakout boxes, Aquabus cables, uh, sensors, uh, auto top off kits. I tried to get a little bit of each thing. I didn't buy everything. There's like 98 things that Neptune sells but I got a small amount and I've got to take everything and photograph everything and get it updated to the website and put it up there. And so in the future, if you guys want gear from Neptune, I could be the guy that you buy from. And since I've mentioned my website a couple of times now, I might as well stick it on the screen. Milosreef.com is what supports me and allows me to pay the bills. And then, you know, I usually say so I can eat and so spa can eat, but in this case, it's going to be to feed the doctor. <laughs> so anything that you buy is going to help me stay in business and take care of good care of you guys so i appreciate any business i get cool guy simon i just figured out how to comment on your youtube while live streaming well welcome aboard you're in the conversation now uh, thanks for following the channel since the beginning and uh yeah i'll keep trying to do good work uh, lots of comments about uh Luconazole. Uh, I guess I should say that while you're on this channel, if you haven't yet, if you aren't a subscriber to the channel, you should be. And if you want to do a thumbs up, I always appreciate that as well. If you want to share what I've discussed with other people so they can benefit too, you know, feel free to do that. Anything you do that helps build the channel up more is greatly appreciated because uh, that way we can help more people. Uh, 
uh, Discus Keeper says, I have a weird problem with my skimmer. It's the Bubble Magnus Curve number nine. It's just fizzing and not really producing foam. Let's pretend you haven't added anything to the water that would affect the skimmer, like oily foods, like P.E. Mysis, for example. Have you checked on your skimmer multiple times per day to always see it looking like that? Have you looked at the intake of the skimmer where the water shoots in and make sure it's not obstructed? And have you checked the Venturi line that sucks in air that it's not obstructed? You may have to actually remove the, the, the intake pipe, pull off the tubing and look inside the orifice. It could have a big clump of salt in there. It could be that the pump itself has a bunch of crap inside the, the impeller itself and needs to be cleaned. It could be snails are stuck in there. So, you know, or snail shells or stomatellas or uh, vermited tubing, you know, all kinds of little weird things happen. So make sure your skimmer is completely clean top to bottom and not adding anything to your tank that is considered oily like P.E. Mysis because that will shut down a skimmer. Um, if you are dosing something like Benary foods, it will definitely collapse the bubbles for a little while while the tank is eating and then it, the skimmer resumes. I actually, when I use Benary, I don't have to turn off my skimmer, which is very convenient. I hope that that helps. Um, yes, I did. I had an operation over here um, four years ago. So I'm wondering if it's time for another one, which means another cut. But, you know, if it happens, it happens. Tyler asked, if, do you have any earthquakes in your area? We don't. Uh, we are not where I live in Fort Worth, Texas. We aren't on a fault line. I do think there's one somewhere in Texas, but we haven't been hit by any kind of an earthquake uh, ever that I can think of. And I've been here since I was 17. Yes, I got the Trident way back when they were still in NSI testing, and they asked me to be a tester, and so I've been running mine for several months. And I did a, a, an unboxing video about it, so now I just have to film like all the rest of it so I can get that out to you guys. Oh, this is a good question. Glenn says, if I dose live phytoplankton in a cup of salt water mixed with other coral foods, will the food lose its nutritional value as the coral foods absorb it? Or is it best to dose it separately? You know, I have a feeling that, you know, because when you're mixing it and you're about to pour it in your tank, it, it's still pretty fresh. It's not like you mixed it and let it sit overnight or all day long or, you know, it's sitting in the fridge all the time. So I think you're good to go. I do know that people have gut loaded brine shrimp with phytoplankton before they fed the brine shrimp to the tank. So that way when the fish or the corals ate the brine, they'd also get some phyto because it was in the belly of the brine shrimp. So I don't think it would be a, a problem. I don't think it's going to affect it one way or another. Uh, it's easy to pour in phyto. And I know in the past, you know, we would leave the skimmer off for like 45 minutes. I don't even know if it's needed to be that long for your tank to absorb it. It also depends on what strength of phyto you have, or if it's homegrown, or if you're buying the really thick stuff from Reef Nutrition, the Phyto Feast. Those are, you know, really condensed and a little bit probably goes a very long way. I do know that dosing phytoplankton can help keep your glass from getting as green as quickly, which is interesting. It's like that live algae is consuming stuff in the water, so that way you, you don't end up with a film algae on your glass. So that's kind of cool. Gary, hi from Albuquerque. Hi from Texas. Ah, I'm sorry. I didn't get that part, Alex. Sorry. Uh, do I have a Trident for sale? You know, I didn't even ask because it is so freaking popular that I just figured if I asked, they'd just laugh at me because I was a first time buyer, you know? But uh, I am kind of curious if I could get one or two or three <laughs> to sell. That would be nice. I, you know, I know they're trying really hard. I've been reading posts lately on the Neptune group on Facebook that someone will say, hey, I'm on Aqua Cave. Oh my God, Tridents are available and in stock and it lasts about four minutes, where before it lasted about 30 seconds. So obviously some of these stores are getting more and more gear in and people have a chance to buy it now, where before it was really almost like a lottery system. You, know, you had to be super fast and hopefully win. Uh, 
Uh, the tours that I usually do are on the anniversary year of my tank. So if you wanted to see a tour that already exists right now, since you know I'm kind of down, you can go to the five-year anniversary tour, you can go to the four-year anniversary tour, you can go to the three-year anniversary tour, all of those pretty much do, a, I do a full walkthrough of the tank and show you all the latest. So this year should be good because it'll be the six-year anniversary, new sump, new top-off container, uh, new refugium light, new fans, trident, uh, something else can't talk about. Um, I'll have a new pump hooked up to my saltwater storage vessel by then. Um, new uh, dosing pumps. So, I mean, there's a lot of new things that have changed since the five-year anniversary. Jay, I actually think a reef bot and a trident is a good transaction because the trident covers alkaline calcium and magnesium, and then the reef bot can do the other stuff like nitrate and phosphate. And the apex itself will do pH, temperature, and ORP, and possibly salinity if you buy it with that probe. So you could pretty much cover almost everything. And then, like I said, Mindstream is coming to market, and it covers a lot of those things as well, and it's constantly testing all the time. But that is a standalone device that doesn't uh, communicate with anything you own. So it's more like you're informed, and now you can go turn a dial, adjust a knob, switch a switch on or off to adjust what you want to do. But you're not able to control automatically like I can program my calcium reactor based on what the trident's results are when it comes to alkalinity but yeah so I feel like those two go hand in hand and it, it's a direction I would lean myself the trident is not standalone it is a testing device that is plugged into the apex and you have to have the current apex not the old classic version and when you hook it all up then it will start communicating and do its job Screams Reef says, will you be Reef of Palooza, California this year? No, I am not going anywhere. If I'm going anywhere, I'm going to the doctor. <laughs> uh, that is the one trip I chose not to make this year. You know, I get a lot of invites to a lot of places, and, you know, there's other... Like, I was considering, oh, I want to go to Reef of Palooza in New York, because I've never been to it. And I wasn't able to go. I was too busy. I think I was building my new sump. And then I turned around, and I came into, uh, you know, I, I mean, this month rolled in. I was like, ooh, Aqua Shell, I mean, uh... Reef of Palooza, California is about to happen. And I was like, no, because I'm doing Macna and I'm doing Aquashella. So I've got those two trips. And I've got another one coming up after that, which is, I believe I'm going to Iowa. Uh, Grand Rapids? I think No, that can't be right. I can't remember where I'm going. I'm going somewhere. Um, so that trip has been booked for a speaking engagement as well. So those are three things coming up. Um... Rosano, I don't know the answer to your question. I actually own the solenoids. I've had them for a while, and I haven't hooked them up. I feel like I don't know enough about them to use one yet. And I, I, I heard something that was probably a rumor and probably not true. But since I haven't found out the facts, I just haven't touched it. I need to actually go do my research, learn how it works, learn how it doesn't work, and uh, then decide how I want to implement it on my system. When I bought it, I bought it a very long time ago, probably two, three years ago. Still brand new in the package. I haven't even unwrapped it yet. I wanted to hook it up to my RODI system to... I mean, wouldn't it be cool, like, if your floor gets wet, it closes the solenoid, no more water goes in the RO unit? That's a good solution. Or if your top-off container is full to the top and the sensor registers on the apex it's full, it stops the water going into the RO system. It doesn't stop the water coming out. It stops the source. And so I was thinking I would like to go that route. But, and so I bought all this gear. I think I spent like $300 for all the pieces I needed. And then I realized I had to run an Aquabus cable through my attic from the utility room all the way to the fish room. And that is the last thing I want to do. <laughs> so that project has never been done. And so I have all that brand new gear that's never been hooked up. So that was the long version of the question you asked. Will it work? And where do you put the screws? I don't know. I apologize. Uh, yes, uh, I knew this was going to come up. Samuel, you busted me. No clarity yet. Uh, God, I really thought I would get that hooked up this week, but then I felt so rotten that I couldn't go deal with the plumbing under the tank, uh, you know, to get that one. Because I've got to remove the sock box, put in the new stand, put the clarity in place, and then i got to hook up some plumbing parts to the clarity from my emergency drain bulkhead. And I know it's going to involve some work and some plumbing. Uh, I, I might just press all the plumbing together, not even glue it because it's in the sump. But <clears throat> I don't know. And I just didn't have the energy or the desire. I was just hurting too much. I mean, I was literally 
debating, do I go to the ER and just have them cut me open and start figuring out what's wrong? I mean, it was really bad. So I was very fortunate that this week I never finally hit a migraine. It stopped before it got to that point, but it was so darn close. And migraines are the worst. I'm not talking about a bad headache. And I, I've mentioned migraines in the past. I didn't know what a migraine was. And one of my friends, was a he suffered from them greatly. And I said to him, can you tell me what a migraine is? Because people always say, oh, I have a migraine. And I just feel like it's a bunch of BS. And he said, okay, let me tell you what a migraine is. Imagine someone drilling a hole into your head. I'm like, okay. And he goes, you got it? I'm like, yeah, there's a hole in my head. He goes, that hurts, right? I'm like, yeah. He goes, now someone's going to jam a spoon into your brain. And I was like, okay. He says, now someone's going to keep flicking the handle over and over and over. That's a migraine. And I was like, okay, I got the visual now. So I can tell you this. A migraine is such a bad headache that personally for myself, you want to be somewhere completely dark. You want to be somewhere where there's no sound. Any kind of light hurts, any kind of sound hurts. And heat is a problem too. I remember there was times where I suffered so bad I would lie down on the tile floor trying to cool off because the ceramic tile was cooler than carpet or my bed. Um, I've done ice packs, I've done all kinds of stuff, but a migraine is horrible. I used to suffer from them greatly. Uh, four years ago I had the disc installed that replaced a bad disc and that reduced my migraines by about 90%. So I was very pleased about that outcome. And so, you know, I, it's not PTSD, but yeah, when I see a migraine coming, I am wanting to run away from it. And I was very lucky. I didn't have one hit uh, two days ago. Yesterday, yesterday. I actually, it felt so bad. I went to the gym anyway. Well, <laughs> so I wanted to go to the gym because I wanted to work on these muscles and try and strengthen things and kind of pull my, just work the muscles on my shoulders and back and front, you know, and just try and get the neck to release. And my head was so close to a migraine, I was like, God, I can't go. And then I started to feel better. I thought, okay, I'm gonna go to the gym and try and work out those muscles. And I did go for a, a little while and I worked out a total of 30 minutes and I started to feel like I was gonna throw up. And I was like, okay, I'm done. And I didn't feel like pushing through that. I figured that was good enough. And I came back home and I got a few orders out and uh, got a little bit of stuff done last night. Uh, you know, like the mountain of dishes were finally washed, you know, that kind of stuff. But I have not been the productive person I'm used to being because of all the pain. Uh, Lone Aquarius, I never said exactly what happened because I don't know what happened. I have basically three wrong things in my spine. Uh, scoliosis, degenerative disc disease, arthritis. And I have had all of those for a long time, which is very weird. I should not have had those. I mean, scoliosis, yes. Uh, the other two things shouldn't have happened at my age, and yet they still did and they've been a plague ever since. I don't have something like say, oh, I was in a car accident, it caused all this. I was in a, in a hit and run accident once where someone ran me down when I was on a motorcycle and uh, you know, I went to the ER and they stitched me. And there was another time where I was stripping and waxing a floor and I literally did a flip and landed on my head and split my skull open. Maybe one of those two times got my neck, I don't know. But uh, this all started really being a problem. I mean, it was, it was a problem in the early 2000s, and it got really bad in about, by 2013 it was super bad. And by 2015 I couldn't take it anymore. And I, now it's 2019, I'm back to that part where I can't take it anymore. So that's kind of where I'm at. Yes, Oscar, I will be at Macna. I might as well show you this. So, this is a big reveal. And uh, at Macna we are doing a meetup. Is that on my screen here where I can show it with you guys? I don't know where the graphic is. Here it is. Okay, I found it. So we'll put it here. We'll shrink it a little bit, and then maybe it'll fit on the screen. Hang on a second. I'm sorry. So... That is not doing what I want it to do. Let's try this. There we go. So this is the Mila's Reef Macna Meetup. This is the first one we've ever done. And it's gonna be Saturday at 12.30 in an allocated room that uh, we get to have for basically an hour. And the idea is for us to get together. So if you're coming to Macna, let's come hang out for an hour. And uh, I'm playing with a thought, if we have a good signal, to do an actual live stream from the meetup. I thought that'd be kind of fun. 
and we can uh, meet some of the other people that are part of our group here. And when you're there, you are going to get a sticker that says Mila's Reef Community, Magna 2019, and at the top it says, thanks for being a member. So I have printed these stickers to give out at the meetup. And uh, I know you guys are gonna say, mail me one, mail me one, I can't go. Well, I'm doing it meetup first, and then we'll see what's left. But yeah, I printed up some stickers, so that's coming up. There's also something else. Also, I have a few things I think I'm gonna bring as door prizes to give away during that hour. So it should be a fun thing, you know, and you know, don't expect, you know, a, per, uh, a presidential parade, just expect it to be a casual gathering that'll be fun. And uh, after our meetup is done, the following meetup in the exact same room is Reef Trace, which is my app. So if you don't have the Reef Trace app, I want to recommend that you get it. Uh, they've had a lot of changes installed recently to make it even better than before. The Android version will be completely up to date to match the iOS version by before Macna. So you can look forward to that. The, the way you log your parameters has changed and changed and it's gotten better and better over the last year. So if you haven't got it yet, you can. I believe it's $3.99 and it has some really cool features besides logging your information. There's a huge section on just notes and documentation for you to keep track of things. I love the LFS locator that's built in and so I, I highly recommend it. So I will be probably wearing a Reef Trace shirt on Saturday. I might have to change shirts for the meetup though. <laughs> Alrighty, uh, let's see. Matt, I am so glad that you're coming to Macna I'm, because I tell everyone every year, you gotta go. I mean, seriously guys, you gotta go. And I, I recommend it every year. Entry fees right now are only 20 bucks, which is will get you into the vendor hall so you can shop, you can look for corals, you can buy some gear, you can learn some stuff. That's a great deal. Uh, it's in Orlando, Florida. It is the last weekend of this month. It goes you know right before Labor Day, so. August 30th, September 1st, 2nd, something like that. And uh, it's Reef Keeping College in three days. So I highly recommend it. I also recommend people go all three days and not just go for one day. I think everyone wants to go thinking they're going to a gun show or they're going to a car show or they're going to, uh, I don't know, some kind of a show that's a couple hours. This is not that. This is nonstop education for 72 hours. And I highly recommend it. So. Yeah, I'm glad you're coming, and you're coming from New Zealand, which is awesome. So, way to go. Dan says, I have a budget of $750 for a sump. Can you design one for me that out of that, you know, for that price? Yeah, I, I can. And uh, it just depends on the size of the aquarium. So, get with me. Send me an email. Um, there's a contact us link on my website. Send me the email. I have been staying on top of emails. So if you have not gotten an answer from me, I never got it. Because I've been really good about staying up to date with those. And that's always been a hurdle for me because there's so many emails coming in every day. But like right now, I'm completely caught up with everybody. <laughs> See, I knew it. Tyler says, I need the sticker. <laughs> <laughs> Joey says, I will have my landscaper mow your yard for a sticker. You know, I might actually be convinced to cave in on that one. That's a hell of a deal, Joey. <laughs> but you have to stick it on your bumper before you leave. All right. Uh... Okay, Lisa, let's stick you on the screen here. We're about an hour in. We have, uh, see, no one's feeling well today. We're only at 123 people in the group today, where normally we have like 180 or 200. Uh, I disagree about Bryopsis being more stubborn than green hair algae. Fluconazole works great for Bryopsis. It may work on GHA, but doesn't work well for all the turf algae. Well, I consider Bryopsis to be more of a turf algae than GHA, or a green hair algae. <laughs> it's so easy to say the letters. Green hair algae, I have a whole video about how to remove green hair algae, and it actually doesn't involve fluconazole. It involves phosphate RX. And phosphate RX will remove the phosphate from the water overnight. So if your tank is measuring 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 1.0, 3.0, oh, yes, that happens. You can use phosphate RX, knock the phosphate out overnight, you know, use a 10 micron filter sock to catch as much of it as you can, have your nice, clean, efficient protein skimmer. That means not just a dirty skimmer, but you cleaned it before you did this, pulling out anything that can out of the water. The next day, your phosphate's gonna be way weaker. Within about three days, 
the plants will have weakened because the phosphate's gone, and you can start pulling the green hair algae out. And then I want you to take a bowl of water, and I want you to reach into your tank and pick off the algae, put it in your bowl of water, rinse your fingers, put your hand in and pinch, rinse, pinch, rinse, and do this a thousand times so you can't stand it, and then dump out the bowl, and the next day, continue, and then the next day, continue until almost all of it's gone. And once you've reduced 90% of the algae in your tank because you, you weakened it and you've removed a lot of the bulk of it, add that brand new hungry cleanup crew to eat what's left because that's what they're there for. They're there to get rid of algae. You're not, you're not just getting them so you have something to look at and they're not there to clean your glass. I know everyone thinks that's the solution. No one relies on snails to keep their glass clean. <laughs> but hermit crabs and snails will get the algae off your rock if there's not so much of it. And if you have a lot, you need to reduce the mass as much as you can so there's only a little bit left. And then when you find your snails where they don't belong, put them back on the patches of algae so they'll keep working in those areas because you know they're just free spirits. They're wandering around doing their thing. All right. Richie, I understand what you're saying. Omacna costs money to me every year. Uh, I usually have to pay. I mean, I got to go to the Macna here in Dallas in 2012 because that was my Macna, and I got to drive there. And I, I had a hotel room, but I could have come home uh, each night. But I like to be on campus, so to speak. Like I told you, it's reef-keeping college, so I'm on campus for three days. And uh, so yeah, usually Macna costs me about 800 bucks to go to without buying anything special. Um, you could spend another 200 uh, in raffle tickets and you know things you want you couldn't leave without so there there is you know it could be a thousand dollars but that's what credit cards are for you charge now and you pay it later it's a great system right <laughs> look at me encouraging all of you guys to get further in debt i apologize actually try not to use a credit card save your money don't waste it or sell some frags you know some people sell corals for money so they can buy things. <laughs> I know, weird, right? <laughs> I don't understand it. You don't see me doing that, that's weird, that's crazy talk. But you sell some corals, you raise money to go to Magna. And then it's not like coming out of your bottom line, it's coming out of your extra money. So consider that. <laughs> Scott. I have phosphates down to 0 0.03. Congratulations. And the GHA still persisted. Yeah, it will. Um, it was weak and brownish, so it was dying. And manual removal, snails. The scrubbing the rocks, I don't recommend. I just feel like when you scrub it, you spread it, and it lands elsewhere. That's why I'm so adamant that you pinch and rinse off in a bowl or bucket of water next to your tank, and then put your hand in with nothing on it and pull some more out. And keep extracting it so it doesn't land somewhere else take hold and spread again and that's probably why i never have algae in my tank you know it's not that my fish are so amazingly uh helpful that they'll eat every last bit of it and there's some valonia in my tank and you'll see little bits of green here and there on the macro shots you can look really close but for the most part my tanks are algae free i don't sit you don't hear me talking about algae so uh keep in mind too when you're measuring phosphates and it says 0 0.03 could be not true because phosphates can be bound up and I'll tell you this, after a manual removal, when you have been really pulling all this algae out, wait one hour and test your phosphates again. I have a feeling it's not 0 0.03 at that point. Also, one other thing that came to mind about that, um, removal of algae. What was I thinking? It was, it was another important point. Lower the phosphates, pull the algae. It's gone. Sorry, guys. If it comes back to me, I'll tell you. Oh, I'm glad you removed the rocks out of the tank, Scott. That helped. Joey says, I need more phosphate or X. Can I get that from you? Absolutely. And oh, let me throw this in there for you guys. Um, in case you don't know or you're new to the channel, I ship a lot of things on my web. I mean, my website is an online business, so I ship. And my default shipping is FedEx. That's what it is. I had an option for post office only, and people abused the heck out of it, and I had to remove it because everyone thought they could ship giant boxes for $6 and think it would happen, and it won't. So 
I do find alternative ways to ship what you order from me, if I can, especially if it's small and if it's light. So if it's a little tiny thing like Phosphate or X, uh, Ben Arif, uh, Live Rock Enhance, um, the lids that go on top of your overflow box, any of those things that are relatively light, I can ship them first class. Uh, or I can ship them priority mail, which is still less than FedEx. So I always look for the better deal. So if you buy from my website and you're like, oh, why is he charging me $18 shipping? Odds are you're getting $13 of it back in a refund once I've got your order out. So I, I do, I go in there and I constantly send PayPal refunds to people for a little bit to save the money where I can, because I'm not trying to get your money. I, I mean, yeah, I, I need to eat, but I'm not trying to rip you off. And I see a lot of customers abandoning their shopping cart because they don't like the price of shipping. And I don't blame you. I get it. I totally get it. So when you guys buy from me, I know you're buying from me because you're doing me a favor. And I really appreciate that. And I am trying really hard to get that corrected. I've talked with my web developer and he said that he hoped that by the end of this month, he could install something for me where I could create like a flat rate shipping for very specific items. And I can say to the website, if they bought this and nothing else, and no more than this many, we can do it for $6. So you can look forward to that. Mateus, thank you for chiming in for a second while you're at the fish store. I hope you enjoy your new clownfish. Clarkies are a little bit mean though, so you know, watch out. And uh, yes, today is water test Saturday, so please do test your water. Make sure everything is right, test everything. If you haven't done this in a while, it's time to calibrate your refractometer. You want to use calibration solution that's 35 PPT. You put that on the refractometer and then you look through it and it should say 35 PPT. If it doesn't take the tiny screwdriver and adjust it, you know, you're looking through it and you adjust it till it says 35. You do not want to calibrate with RODI water. It has a bad habit and it's not recommended. So I would highly recommend you get some accuracy, which is a calibration solution that is 35 PPT. And it's, <clears throat> it's the way to guarantee that you're very close to our target level, what we're looking for anyway. If you uh, have test kits that you've had for a long time, more than a year, you should replace them with fresh ones, even though they still have liquid in them. Just get rid of them, get new ones. And when you get the brand new one and you open that lid for the first time, grab a Sharpie and write today's date in there so you know that's when I open the box. And that way, every time you open the lid to do another test, you can see if it's still valid or if you've gone too long. Because calibration, I mean, sorry, uh, reagents don't last forever. And every time you take a bottle and you squeeze in the drops into your test tube, when you let go, you hear it suck in air. This air, the air in your room, the air in your fish aquarium area, uh, whatever. And that is gonna aff actually affect the reagents over time. So they can kind of deteriorate a little bit too. So use your test kits, replace them regularly, calibrate things to make sure they're accurate. And then, you, of course, once you get all your numbers figured out, then document them, stick them in Reef Trace, share them to Instagram, share them to Facebook, share them into the Club Milo's Reef. We'd love to see your numbers. Uh, the best part of keeping a reef tank healthy is knowing your water parameters so you can make the small corrections needed before things get really bad. So I highly recommend that. <clears throat> the Briar Patch asked me, what does my shirt say? So let's see if I can help you here. I put words right over it so you can't read it. It says, sorry I'm late. And then it says, you, can, you cannot fast travel when enemies are nearby. And then it says, stuff came up. <laughs> I saw it, matter of fact, bending my neck did not help me just now. Um, I saw this and I had to buy it. <clears throat> Uh, Perrin asks the question, I have a Red Sea Reefer Nano. First of all, I need to know how many gallons that is. Uh, what would be the best algae eating fish for this size tank? You know, odds are it's a Nano, so it's probably small. I would think a lawnmower blenny would be a good one. And some hermit crabs and some snails. So I would suggest that. Coral Vid says, are you going to MACNA? Yes, I am. Are you going to be at MACNA making coral videos? <laughs> what are your thoughts on the benefits of UV sterilizers on a reef system? Actually, I, uh, I don't really recommend it. 
I don't, I'm not talking people out of it, but I don't say it's a need. Some people like to run them. They want to kill the spores from algae from getting out of hand in the tank. So as uh, water passes across the UV light, it kills them. It kills the good bacteria, it kills the bad bacteria. It doesn't know the difference, and it cannot know the difference. Uh, UV light will add heat to the water, so you have to uh, make sure your tank isn't getting too hot from that. Uh, it's another electrical source, it's another thing pulling power. I really think a UV is great for a quarantine tank, and you can use a smaller UV because the quarantine tank is smaller, so it's more economical. And I think it'd be better, better used in those situations when you're dealing with free-floating, uh, like, ick. You know, things that are in the water system, in the water quality, in the water column. And so you want to be able to kill those things off. So I think it's great for quarantine. Uh, there is a few reef keepers that have UV on their systems, but it's not a, a dominant one. And I've never done it in 21 years. Odie says, how do you get rid of diatoms? I don't. Uh, diatoms are a food for your bacteria. How old is your tank? We need to know that. You can definitely have something to stir the sand so it's not quite as visible, but uh, it should take care of itself in a matter of a few months. And Jose knows, Chris, thanks. <laughs> okay, um... I think I'm going to wrap it up here, guys. You know, I, I need to go take a pill. Uh, but I appreciate you guys tuning in for the live stream today. I don't want to waste any more of your time. I hope you guys have a great weekend. I will, of course, update you on what's the latest, you know, when I know more. And uh, next weekend will be the 17th. I'll still be in town. So we do have a live stream next weekend. It's always 2 o'clock on Saturdays. And I hope to have another interesting topic that you will appreciate. Bye, guys. <laughs>